treasurer of, of uh, Georgetown's uh, Board Gaming Society. Um, and so tonight we've got digital transformation of board gaming platforms and the power of story. Um, so uh, I will be turning my mic off and camera off so you don't have to look at my ugly face anymore. But we're really excited to have Andrew Gordon, Stephen Gordon, and Colonel uh, Walter Yates <clears throat> uh, hosting tonight. Um, so I won't try and butcher your resumes. I'll, I'll let you guys kind of introduce yourselves, but just a, a quick kind of how this works. Typically, um, if, if uh, we do ask that people, uh, obviously our non-presenters, non turn your uh, mic and camera off just to kind of reduce the bandwidth and, and uh, outside noise. Um, and if you have uh, questions or comments, feel free to toss them in the chat or to me privately. Um, and whether there's, if our presenters want to have, you know, kind of a break for questions or we can kind of just do them all at the end, I'll, I'll log them and just ask them. Um, okay, so without any further ado, uh, feel free to take it away, guys. Thank you again for coming. All right, well, thank you. I'll kick it off to Stephen. Uh, I'm going to be joined by two experts, uh, Andrew Gordon, my brother, Ashley. We look a lot alike. I'm going to save my bandwidth, save you from watching me, look at the slides, and Walt Yates. Uh, two of us have wargaming experience. My brother has a lot of experience in story, story craft, many years at Pixar, without going into in, in other places. And I think what we're going to go about here is somewhat of a hybrid approach to what I've seen Sebastian run in the past in terms of our experience in wargaming. I think what you're going to take away here is an understanding of technology. Uh, the, the need for better storytelling and tools to promote storytelling to a platform that can help de uh, design an environment that produces rich insights. And without getting into too much of our resume, I'll just kind of show what it looks like. Uh, this is us, this is who we learned from. <laughs> you probably recognize these faces. Uh, Walt Yates, you know, retired Marine. I met Walt when he was in uniform, walking the halls of Quantico when about five years ago. I started really digging into this concept of you know, bringing Microsoft's experience with AAA gaming and delivering a hyperscale cloud and bringing everybody together for productivity needs and really thinking about the problem of helping the Marine Corps uh, modernize and transform the way that they analyze, run war games, distribute themselves, uh, attack problems, analyze and produce answers faster and hopefully with more precision. So I just really climbed up on the second deck of a building at the Wargaming uh, Lab and started digging in as a problem solver at Microsoft. That's kind of what we're, we're, we're there to do. And you can see you know, from the, the people that were hanging around in the screen, uh, that's kind of what they expect of us. Um, Walt, you wanna say a quick hello and then Andrew a quick hello? Uh, good evening, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my background is, lest anybody uh, be confused about where I come from in the Marine Corps. My uh, background started in the field artillery and I transitioned over at about the 15 year point in my career into modeling and simulation and then finally ended up being an acquisition management officer for training systems. So my perspective on this is in the application of modeling and simulation to support wargaming. But as we will come to discuss, wargaming is an inherently human in the loop um, activity and uh, simulations can support, um, but they are not the, the primary function. And uh, I'll pass it back to Steve or Andrew. Yep. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Andrew Gordon, uh, Steve's brother. <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of work in a different industry. I'm, I'm mostly working in uh, the entertainment business. And I was at Pixar for 20 years, Warner Brothers before that. And I spent a couple years in London and Paris working on some films. And now I'm back in California. Nice to be here. So Andrew wins on the weather, and uh, we'll, we'll continue. So here's my experience in Wargaming, and Walt's going to add some commentary. Uh, started maybe five years ago or so. I've traveled around to all of these different places and supported these customers that uh, we had working at Microsoft, supporting uh, every region around the globe, essentially. And they all came to have different problems, and we weren't necessarily talking always about wargaming. We're talking about sort of the challenges and the nuances in, in a lot of different regions. So as we were traveling around trying to transform using technology and improving processes for really decision support and analytics and bringing cloud native capabilities, whether it was developing new software, 
or using existing on-premise capabilities combined with the cloud, uh, we found that the problems, they, they sort of shared a common need to get to more answers quick quicker. And for the European community, it was about, it was a lot of the conversation was around gaming and simulation of logistics problems. Uh, a couple of the conversations, and by the way, all of this is unclassified. A um, couple of the conversations we were having as we looked at the map of the European theater were centered around logistics and the movement of equipment in and around the tight European theater where commercial shipping ports were, you know, were part of the equation and you know, lower end security around those uh, ports. You know, they're not DOD strength. Sometimes those ports were owned by foreign countries and companies. Uh, you know, a little lesson from World War II, they used to cut the rail gauge so you couldn't offload your equipment when you moved things around, they even took out entire rail tracks. But just the gauge of things different from country to country uh, made it hard for them to kind of predict and, and answer the question, did my supplies arrive? Or did I get hit by a deep fake on the way of that transport, whether it's dry goods, bullets, people, food, whatever? Am I going hit, to get hit by a cyber attack that looks like my equipment arrived, but it really went someplace else? And then we kind of pivot over to the Indo-Pacom region, and the conversation started to pivot around all these new man-made islands popping up. And long-range standoff was the, was the kind of the, you know, the question and topic of the day. And, you know, what is technology what does a software company have to do with with any of that and then some of the other commands around the map you can sort of see that information warfare was becoming a, a, a problem uh, didn't know what was real or fake seemed legitimate the sources seemed legitimate uh, but a little article that started down in uh, the horn of africa at a small newspaper online sort of grew and grew the story was repeated by legitimate news agencies and, and, and promoted and all of a sudden it became sort of the source of truth um, so information warfare, especially afloat, uh, looking at a bunch of different systems, if any of you have ever been in a, in a jock, you're looking at a lot of different stuff, like you would maybe on a Wall Street trading floor, when there were Wall Street trading floors with people dominating the, the, the floor, now it's kind of electronic, but it was almost the same kind of environment, and being in New York, I've been in those environments, I've been in the pits down the Mercantile Exchange, I believe the Marine Corps actually visited the Mercantile way back in the, in, in, uh, the late 90s, and said, you know, you guys are much like us. You're looking at a lot of information. It's kind of chaotic. We don't know what's exactly truth, but we've got to make some sense of this stuff and fast. So uh, with that commentary, I'll kind of kick it over to Walt because I think he has some commentary on the com combatant commands and the fighting force that is, uh, is in need of more than support planning. And Walt, maybe you have a couple of comments on that. Yeah, when you look at this uh, picture of the geographic combatant commands, um, this, raises a point that's important to understand about making a delineation between different purposes of war games. These combatant commanders are in command of forces deployed in these regions today, and their need for war gaming is mostly in the domain of emergent threats that they will have to counter and respond to with the force that they have right now. So they're talking about the, the forces that they have available or that could be deployed into their area of operations and the equipment sets that they have. Um, that's a near-term application of wargaming and it fits within the uh, Army's military decision-making process and the Marine Corps' Marine Corps planning process. It's a step in that uh, course of action development analysis and or wargaming and then uh, issuing the orders and executing an operation. The other side of wargaming is a longer term where you're looking at a scenario and potential threats and adversaries that are several years in the future, um, 10, 20 years in the future, perhaps. So that type of wargaming is done mainly for the purpose of force design. You're not necessarily going to be accurate in your assumptions about the, the adversaries that you may face, hopefully somewhat accurate, but it's more about determining now the long lead time that it takes to recruit, train, and equip and organize the force that you will need to counter the emergent threats. And this, these emergent scenarios depend not only on technological advances, but also um, geopolitical and diplomatic circumstances and, and other factors. So I just wanted to raise the, in your mind, the idea that there is near-term wargaming 
you fight the, the war with the force you have and long-term war gaming, designing the force that you want to have to achieve overmatch and dominance in the future. Steve? Yeah, thank you, Walt. And, and I think it's important here to settle on a definition. And then I'm gonna take you through a couple of the issues and challenges and we'll get into the technology and story crafting. Uh, but, uh, you know, when, when the definition here is pointed out in the joint publication, has a focus on human decision-making and conflict as opposed to sort of computer algorithms executing the doctrine. Uh, the role that the staff plays is, is a unique outcome versus uh, automating doctrine. And again, Walt, back to you on that uh, commentary on the definition as you pointed this out as, as the understood definition of wargaming across the services. Yes, so uh, unlike a simulation or a, a deterministic analysis or even stochastic analysis, um, where, where it's repeatable um, using the same pseudo-random number seeds, the human element in actual wargaming means that you're never going to have exactly the same outcome with different people or even the same people on different days with the initial conditions because there is that element of human uh, decision making and the way you change your, your thinking over time and experience and uh, so forth. So key elements in this definition is that it's a synthetic environment in which people make decisions and respond to those consequences to the consequences of those decisions. So by synthetic environment, we can mean things as simple as the board game and the, the original Kriegspiel that the um, Prussian general staff uh, developed in the 19th century and to which is very similar board games and tools are used today to virtual and constructive simulations with computer generated forces that act and execute the, the commands of the humans in the loop. And it raises an important question that you have to uh, determine early in the design of your war game. How big do you want, how, how many humans in the loop do you want? Do you want it to be just the commander and the primary staff officers, or do you want to expand it to a few levels farther down and get a different feel and different type of uh, outcome? But uh, that, more on that in the planning process. Little yeah, bit. thanks, Walt. And so, you know, when you think about what's a software company have to do with this, or, you know, so where does technology fit? So we felt as we speak to the different service branches and participants, stakeholders, developers, war games, consultants, and so on, that, you know, it's, it's generally agreed to that the modern technology uh, transformation to enhance war gaming could improve decision analysis if you had more realistic simulation of conflict and not just kinetic, but as Walt said, diplomatic, sort of non-kinetic environments, more, more realistic and challenging data to the equation. So a synthetic environment, but with humans in the loop, but a little bit more challenging on the data side. And I wanna kind of come back as, as we was talking about kind of traveling around the different commands, combatant commands, uh, these were some of the points that we kept hearing over and over again. I'm talking about my colleagues and myself and coming back to the, the command posts and sort of debriefing for the day. Uh, these kind of five, six, seven, eight topics or so kept coming back around. And the Marine Corps is where we started digging into you know, where, where could we make some improvements in the use of technology for wargaming. And some of the feedback was, uh, as you see on the board here, it's typically a, a offensive and kinetic operation. Um, the non-combatants are not usually participating. You can see it's two-dimensional. I'm not taking anything away from the value of using sort of legacy capabilities that you see up there in the black and white checkerboard that's, that's uh, at the Naval War College. You can see people kind of looking through maps um, as they are in sort of modern day. You know, different versions of sand tables and so on. Uh, very difficult to display a multi-domain operation, obviously, on a two-dimensional plane or on a board. As you move through uh, some of the realistic discussions, uh, you can visualize it. And we know, and this is kind of in Andrew's domain, that there is an art to telling a story through a visually appealing sort of method. And we want the concepts and the front end of the war game to really stick so that your role, your participation, your understanding of the world that you're in or the multiple worlds that you are living in, whether it's in space, 
air, sea, land, cyber. You might be living in all these worlds at once. We want to kind of uh, depict that so that you can have some aha moments. I never thought of that moment. Or, you know, you're, you're partnering with people who have had experience in these domains. But, you know, with, with more dynamic, back to the trading floor example, more dynamic data coming in, you know, you might get 20 more insights had you had a little bit more visually represented environment. And I kind of liken that, as Andrew and I were talking, to a short before. Have you ever seen one of the Pixar movies? It's kind of the short before the feature. Uh, maybe that's kind of a, a way forward. Uh, war games include commanders and their staff. Chip, typically, uh, the commander plus the sections, the G1, 2, 3, which is running the game, the 5. And as you add more layers to the game, you know, maybe you want to call in some additional expertise. I kind of think about the LinkedIn model. You know, what if I had that kind of capability where I could reach out to an expert uh, that has experience that doesn't matter where they are. Uh, it just, they have an expertise that I need to tap and they're the best at what they do. And I want the best answers coming into my, or insights rather, coming into my model to, to take into consideration. So how do we turn that corner? And before I move on that, Walt, anything else on your, on your plate before we move on to the, to the next step? Well, if you know, look at these pictures and um, think about how, what's being executed here, you realize the importance of taking notes because the record of what happened during a war game is traditionally recorded in a mostly manual fashion. And of course you can video uh, and, and audio record the events in a traditional war game, but part of the, the, the potential for digital transformation is to record objective data on the simulations that you use to support this. And the people don't change the, the importance of their role, but part of the idea behind a digital transformation is that you could provide those people with more realistic data streams and information that would more accurately simulate the environments in which they would actually execute an operation. Um, so it's, it's the belief that with better stimuli for our human decision makers, we could potentially have better outcomes or more useful outcomes from our uh, wargaming. And the, the, the wargaming is, is uh, it's an activity that, that is important side by side with pure analysis, because when you go to, to go to the budgeting process and make demands for, or demands or requests for new generations of weapon systems and the cost is significant, you have to bring data and some analytical experience to justify what the services request to fulfill their Title X responsibilities in the future. And we need better answers and, and more confident answers. And that's why I believe the Marine Corps is investing in their wargaming capability. Yeah, thank you, Walt. So if we kind of have an understanding so far of the definition of wargaming, and we see a little bit of the challenges of previous and sort of legacy environments. And we understand there's gotta be some role for digital transformation. We can probably think of what they are. I mean, Walt is an advisor to Epic Games. Andrew's in the entertainment business. They use the same kind of engine to produce the same kind of appealing visual aids. And with hyperscale clouds, the ubiquity of computing and networking and decision-making aids and voice assistance and everything out there. There's no shortage of tools. And I kind of likened it back for a moment before I get into this slide, that at, at Microsoft, they own a bunch of different studios, but it turns out they're not all using the same tools. They have different processes. You know, they're making games. They're making visually appealing games as are other, other studios. It doesn't seem that there's a uniform standard to things. So if we look at some of these books, this is kind of, uh, the thought leadership or some of them, uh, certainly everybody is kind of aware or maybe you're, you're not aware. Peter Perla, his name comes up quite a bit when you talk about wargaming and kind of lays out the steps and the, and the sort of the construction of the process in a war game and the details behind that. And a new book written by Jeff Applegat, uh, The Craft of Wargaming, digs into it even further with a little bit more of a modern approach and modern lens to it. And you know, we can look at a good colleague of mine, friend Peter Singer, he kind of tests your imagination with, okay, if this is the standard, 
uh, think about what's going to happen in the future. And it's kind of odd that a lot of his his books have actually come to life, Ghost Fleet uh, and recently Burn In, where you know you're challenged to think about how this this model, these processes, and these problems kind of equate to the future of war fighting, where you're going to fight side by side with an autonomous capability. Uh, there's less people in aircrafts. There's more autonomy. Uh, what about the non-kinetic world in, in the di diplomacy ranks? So you have some future thinkers here. You have some great frameworks. And I think it, it so far to me sounds to me like digital transformation. And I wanted to kind of focus on a particular phase. You know, wargaming has so many different, you know, complex phases to it um, that I wanted to focus this discussion mostly on that green box there in the initiation phase. Uh, these books do a great job of laying, that, laying it out. Uh, not too thick a section on exactly how to go about pulling out the problem. And this is kind of why I pinged my brother and you know, Walt with his experience walking around and talking to different, different people in his career. I think there's some lessons to be learned. And let me, let me ex try to explain. In, in this initiate phase, you can think about this as the problem ga gathering or what is the theme of your story? What are you trying to uh, solve? Um, just like many commercial technologies have proven valuable to solving commercial uh, or complex military problems, that is, uh, we think there's some merit in not only the tools, but in the art of story crafting. So for this phase, the Wargaming team members typically have been comprised of people with background in doctrine, operations, um, analytics, you know, even gaming. Um, but to go back to the previous slide, where you have uh, some different challenges in a complex multi-domain environment now, uh, the world has changed. The problems are more complex. Uh, the data does not tell the story anymore. Um, and I think that this phase itself, if you're an advisor, you're a developer, you're that pre-planning pre phase expert that's trying to help pull the details out of what exactly is the theme of your problem. Who are the characters? What world are we living in? What are we trying to solve for? Uh, I think there's some things to to look at in the crafting of story. And there is a reason, and I'm not gonna take Andrew's thunder, that you go into some movies and you forget them as soon as you leave the theater, but the things that Andrew's worked on, you remember for the rest of your life. You remember these stories because they're impactful, they're personal, they are memorable, they cut through the noise and they get to sort of the heart of, of what you're trying to accomplish visually. And then you can get into the framework and you can sort of kind of plot along with the various tools. And now the tools are working for you because you've designed the, the story so well that the tool is just going to help you execute it. Uh, similarly to story development, you know, the question behind a war game has to be engaging and it has to be important enough for people to want to engage. Even though I might have to participate in this war game, I actually would like to uh, engage and what I'll take a page from one of Andrew's leaders at Pixar again work for your meal I'm not going to give you four I'm going to give you two plus two you've got to work for it so uh, Walt had a kind of uh, illustration of the road to war before desert storm and I'd like him to kind of elaborate on that for a moment and we can move on Walt. well it this is uh, not so much part of a war game um, but it was in a diplomatic failure to appreciate what was being communicated passively in the road up to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Communications had been made to the U.S. ambassador to Iraq about Iraq's uh, refusal to acknowledge the borders established after World War II and the sovereignty of Kuwait. And the answer, was the information was not fully appreciated by the ambassador and her answer was something that suggested to the Iraqi government, the US would not react strongly if Iraq annexed uh, Kuwait. And that series of events that resulted in Iraq invading Kuwait and having a completely unanticipated response, not only from the United States, but a very large coalition that resulted in Desert Shield and then Desert Storm is the type of narrative that can really help you get a better war game for having people engaged in the, the story and the details of the circumstances leading up to it. Because when you start the war game, 
everything going forward is your decision, but understanding and appreciating the situation that preceded it is really critical to getting the answers that you need um, to the question that the sponsor has laid out for the, the war game to answer. And uh, just bear that in mind. Uh, you could also look to the uh, OIF and the invasion of Iraq and what the mission definition was and what it turned into after consolidation in phase four. And where did the, you know, great question, where did the war games end after the uh, overthrow and phase four operations began with the consolidation on the objectives in Iraq and the destruction of the Iraqi military? And uh, it seems intuitive to us now that there probably should have been a lot more detailed war games about the indigenous population and how they are going to behave and what the circumstances are going to be like for them that ultimately gave rise to an insurgency. I'll turn it back over to Steve. Yeah, I think we're going to go back to you. And if you thought that my previous comment about legacy environments, we're going to go, uh, was legacy enough, we're going to go way back in time here with a comment that uh, Walt and I were speaking about from this, what looks to be a graph or a chart. Maybe you want to elaborate on, on what the meaning well, of this is, Walt. Well. I would uh, think that most people have, who've taken the time to register for this are familiar with Menard's graphical illustration of Napoleon's campaign to um, invade Russia and lay siege to Moscow. And this graphic packs into a very simple uh, convention and legend, um, a lot of information. And it's the width of that vector starting at Paris on the left in brown and moving to the right is the size and manpower of the Grand Army. And every time it changes direction, there's either a battle or as you see in the vertical lines connecting it to the graph, a river crossing. And you realize that they lost a lot more forces in crossing cold rivers than they did in fighting battles. And they had a huge problem with desertion. And ultimately, after they give up siege of Moscow, actually never really got started, they turn around and only a fraction of the army makes it back to Paris. Tens of thousands, perhaps 100,000 um, dead Frenchmen um, because there was no real coherent operational plan and war game. The, the, one of the fundamental problems in, in Napoleon's planning was the presumption that they would live off the land and and forage as they move through Russia to uh, gain enough food to survive. And that quote at the bottom was by then Captain, later Major General Samuel B. Griffith, um, who observed that wars and battles are not lost by private soldiers. They win them but don't lose them. They're lost by commander staffs and troop leaders and they're often long lost, lost long before they start. So that that statement right there crystallizes why the activity of wargaming is critical if you are in a position either in uniform or in the civilian uh, branches of government involved in making decisions about the provisioning and the commitment of the military to accomplish national objectives because people will die even in the best executed and, and most uh, meticulously planned operations so it's a matter that's that, that's a moral duty to do well. Yeah, thank you, Walt. So let's get a little bit more modern. Uh, that was a great example. Uh, and let's talk about some tools and some portability from the commercial world. So here's a bunch of pictures. Some you might recognize, some you might be sort of, oh, I've I read that in the paper. So we know that we need this scale because the problems are multi-layered, they're complex, they're dynamic. They're time-based now, and they are extreme environments, right? So I look at the world of the AAA game world where Epic is doing some phenomenal things. AAA game titles feel realistic. They hold true to physics models, um, like the one you see up in the upper left, where roads, uh, as you drive around them, you can't take those turns at 80 miles an hour, obviously, so you slip off the road. The weather changes, uh, altitudes is, is, is an issue. Um, so you're really kind of held to the road by the physics models that games have, have really become uh, known for in the AAA world. Um, and then let's go down to the left, lower left, where 
looking at instead of a two-dimensional environment on a, on a board game, for instance, uh, I needed a little bit more situational awareness. And I put on my three-dimensional lens, my augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, a few players in, in the world of this, this new view. Uh, I might want to roll the clock back a week and see what it looked like a week before. So those orange and yellow bars might have indicated the presence of abnormal foot traffic in an area that's never populated. It could be a lingering chemical gas in the air. I didn't know that by looking at the board, but now I know it. It was there a week ago, a day ago, and I could sort of see, is this a pattern? Is this a time of year <laughs> thing? Uh, is this tied to something that I might have read in the news and maybe just didn't take into consideration? So forget for the moment that I can sort of pivot this view around. If I just can kind of take a look at this, even for a moment, I don't have to stay engaged in a three-dimensional view the entire time. I now have more answers or potential questions swarming around my head than I might have had if I didn't know this. Um, technology itself as an aid can also be kind of challenging where you see this issue in uh, Russia with cyber attack on a GPS. Uh, grid in the Ukraine where it made boats on the water appear to be inside of soccer stadiums and in driveways and land and while we know GPS is reliable it might have caused a momentary pause and and caused some sort of suppression. Uh, Walt keeps me straight on suppression versus uh, decoy and deception but now I can't really trust my GPS and for a moment I've got to pull out my map. So I'm kind of denied for a moment and I you know I used to be able to rely upon that now I can't. And frankly, just now the lower right, just the presence of a lot of networks and sensors, um, commercial, military, you know, this gives off a lot of EMF signature uh, or what I've heard referred to as digital exhaust, digital signature. Uh, you've got sensors in all domains, right? Under the surface, in space. Uh, Elon Musk has taken what, what used to be a $27,000 per kilogram to launch in something out into outer space is now a couple of hundred dollars uh, for him and more reliable. So you're gonna see a lot more innovation happening around you, whether you like it or not, it's happening in every domain and you have to account for it and you have to plan for it. And the answers need to come quicker than they have come in the past. So how do we, how do we tackle that? Um, I'll kind of move kind of forward a little bit. This is a couple of data points on just the mixed reality kind of universe. You know, a lot of the times we're kind of just trying to distill technology down into consumable bites, right? So to distill all the technology that's out there, it seems kind of overwhelming. Should I go cloud? What's, what's my mobile device look like? Should I be wearing a lens or should I be using a tablet? Uh, the map is typically the UI. So Epic has done a rendering up here at the upper left-hand corner of, of an area of operation. Um, it allows me to kind of take a simplistic look at an environment with some sort of mixed reality lens on. And one of the main goals here of obviously of a, of a mixed reality experience is to superimpose virtual content on the user's real world environment for the purpose of providing the user additional information around the surroundings and give you a little bit more situational awareness. Now, if you read anything that Stanford University has published. I know we got, a, we got a Stanford guy on the phone or on the call here, so I can keep myself uh, straight here. They have done a lot of research in this area and suggest there's some really great things about mixed reality. Number one, the retention of information seems to be greater than just using sort of straight up data. In fact, using straight data uh, to look at information uh, in a graph or a chart, people tend to retain about 5% as opposed to VR, AR, which has shown upwards of 80%. So we know that that's a great thing. Um, it also has some issues where if I'm the only individual wearing the lens, it kind of creates a social dynamic that's uncomfortable. Eye contact um, has been a problem. Um, overlay of the assets on an environment may actually overlay with things in the room that just, I, I'm now paying more attention to getting it right in the lens as opposed to paying attention to the problem I'm trying to train myself for and, and, and establishing the theme of the war game. So everything from social, you know, uh, you know uncomfortable situations, uh, people not wearing lenses may, may feel uncomfortable. Uh, there's a value to this technology and then there's things that sort of you have to be, be conscious of that could be challenging. So just a matter of where you start. And over to the AI world, you know, back into the data center now from, from the user experience back over into the, 
where, where the data kind of resides, where information needs to be uh, analyzed from a war game. Uh, I used to say up until a kind of day ago that AI is great at image recognition. It se seems to me that most conversations I've had either in uh, DOD, civilian, or even commercial tends to be first foray into AI seems to be image recognition. Is it a boat? Is it a car? Is it actually a military vehicle or a civilian vehicle? Uh, until a soccer match came on the other day and the AI driven camera thought the bald head of the linesman was the soccer ball. So I got confused. So it's still early innings. I'm not, I'm not uh, saying AI is not helpful. I'm, I'm looking at the work that Sortec is doing um, around data brain architecture and some of the work I'll mention momentarily that Rand is doing in the, in the world of cognition, social behavioral, or the area in, in terms of will to fight and how that makes itself into the construct of a war game. That is extremely promising. Um, but this is no uh, you know, um, replacement for a human, as Walt said. This is always a human in the loop. And AI can't think through some of these kind of critical thinking processes like red herrings, slippery slopes is something you know, that was uh, typically used. I think it was pretty common in the Vietnam Cold, Cold War era that you know, just because of one action, it's gonna inevitably lead to a further undesirable action, uh, false dilemmas. You know, this, th these are things that require a human brain to think through. So we have to kind of be careful of how much we depend on AI I think AI has a great ability to sift through mounds of content and present some options to you, almost in a digital assistant kind of role. So we almost, I think I at one point referred to it to one of the colonels in, down in Quantico as your adjudicator's assistant, just there to kind of whisper in your ear, hey, this might sound interesting to you, might want to not pay attention to it, but maybe you might. And in fact, if we go back you know, to early days of, of, you know, early cloud computing days, really, um, it looked to me that here that Rand pointed out that Microsoft was actually uh, tinkering in this area to begin with in, in their game platforms. And, and some of the things that you could do in a game were extremely advanced, like um, these social uh, activities around, around the circle there that Rand has put together. Uh, making up characteristics of things that might deter you or, or impact will to fight. And there's a lot of emotions that we can all recognize that might come about, not only as an individual, but as a battalion, as a company, as a regiment that could have impact on, on the outcome of a mission, of a move, uh, of your entire operation. Your, your historically, wargaming has been focused on the war of attrition, effects on target, the ability to keep fighting, you know, the non-kinetic realm of human decision, like, you know, Rand has pointed out here, extremely important. But, you know, put yourself in the mind of the board gamer, not, not, not saying that there's not value. If there's a way to kind of include that, awesome. I think that some of the tools, the digital tools, can help uh, accelerate that. Walt, anything else um, on that before we get into the non-kinetic topic? Oh, I'm sorry. That's a good, good transition to it. Yeah, sorry, yeah we'll keep going. Yeah, so that's a, this is a good transition. So in the realm of non-kinetic, um, Walt had pointed out to me some work done by Dr. Barry Silverman, the University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering. I gave, gave credit down below um, of a game called Non-Kin Village. And I think Walt will point out some really interesting things in this, this simulation. Go ahead, Walt. Okay, so about 10 years ago, actually about 13 years ago, the, the problem was recognized that most of our training simulations, as distinct from wargaming, but nevertheless, um, the, the tools that we were using were focused on kinetic attrition and maybe some logistics. It was focused on what can our systems do when they sense and engage enemy systems. And that wasn't at all the what was occupying most of our time in Iraq, uh, fighting Al Qaeda in Iraq. Um, we went there thinking we were fighting and overthrowing the Ba'athist government, and we found ourselves fighting Al-Qaeda in a counterinsurgency environment. And so much of that is left of, um, left of bang in that you, you don't have uh, combat necessarily, and you're trying to avoid it. And so much of that uh, revolves around the non-combatant population and the people that you were there to protect for as long as the mission lasts. And so 
our simulation tools, Virtual Battle Space by Bohemia Interactive, were, were not designed to operate in this area. So Dr. Silverman's work for Nanken Village essentially took the first two or three layers of Maslow's hierarchy of need and implemented that in a playable environment. And not only a playable environment in real time, but something that you could iterate months, weeks, months uh, into the future and see how circumstances would cause a steady environment of uh, economic uh, prosperity or at least uh, subsistence and uh, peacefulness to deteriorate into something much worse if certain aspects of corruption and uh, insurgent influence were not addressed or if the occupation force the, was not sensitive to the uh, needs and behaviors of the local populace. If you keep, treat them with callous disregard, um, you, you create what a, a friend of mine refers to as uh, POIs or pissed off Iraqis. If they think that you don't care about them, um, they're not gonna support your mission, they're gonna support somebody else's. But these type of tools can be used in wargaming for supporting diplomatic and informational uh, campaigns that are left of bang, where our objective in the war game is to prevent a kinetic engagement or uh, combat and to keep things uh, at a non-kinetic level and still achieve our, our objectives. Mm -hmm. So the reason, why didn't this transition into wide use in simply simple terms? Because we withdrew from Iraq and the number of Marines and soldiers deploying into a counterinsurgency environment uh, dropped dramatically, but it's a, a concept that was very innovative and is on the shelf and could be used in a variety of applications. So that, this is a great example of where AI actually did work, right? So the AI knows, as Walt said, are you observing social customs? Are you negotiating small scale diplomatic negotiations to avoid escalation? So a user, a user could inject a condition um, you could uh, you know, simulate environments like uh, hunger or despair, and as, as Walt was saying, you know, Maslow's hierarchy uh, of needs that are being satisfied. Otherwise, you know, you're desperate, and desperate leads to things you might not have considered in your war game. So this is where actually an AI has actually, and it was not so recent, has really turned out to be a valuable asset. So I'm about to turn it over to to Andrew in a moment moment here, but I wanted to kind of just put up there for consideration that uh, much like a storyboard that looks like this early days when you're making a an animated feature it's a lot of different details different acts different actors different themes kind of looks early ugly ugly early you look you're looking at somewhat of a digital transformation journey uh, different people uh, there's different characters there's a world there's technology that comes in along the way it's definitely not linear progression, you have to kind of pick what your objectives are, uh, your belief systems, there's ups and downs, there's crisis, there's things that enable you to do things faster and better, there's strategy, and ultimately there's, there's an environment here that takes you from the ordinary world into an extraordinary world. And your extraordinary world can be, you know, your objective in that initiate phase of a war game if it's, if it's sort of defined correctly. So let me leave you with this kind of thought about where the industry looks at different technologies. So the industry, uh, the technology industry at large, you know, there's a lot of different capabilities out there. So on the left, you can see, look, we have the ability to kind of define some rules, right? The basic CRM uh, that I have in my back pocket tells me where I should start my day. It suggests who to call first, second, third, fourth, based upon news and information and sources of truth that I, I believed to, to be true. And you know, therefore, I, I get a lot of value out of not having to sift through mounds of data because some smart agent's doing that for me. Uh, I know that there is terrain. My, my terrain could be urban, it could be global, it could be regional. So you have all these services and data points that are coming in somewhere. They've got to come, kind of come in somewhere to rest and be analyzed. And you know, we all know that there's a lot of cloud capabilities out there. Transport is fast, it's close, there's proximity to, to your data anywhere you go now, pretty much, even under the water. Uh, there's a lot of data and services that are coming out of not just basic compute, like managing identity and security 
and moving your information around, making it available. But I'm talking about services that allow you to operate in an environment much like you would in esports uh, tournament, where I have uh, leaderboards. I, I can see who's kind of cheating their way to victory. I can see who's winning. I can even see the kind of hardware you're winning on, possibly. Um, one point that I thought was completely not uh, relevant to wargaming was this concept of in-game purchases. Uh, actually, it turns out that there is a role for that. If I want to experiment with a capability or a new weapon platform or something that I only want to give to a certain select group just to see how they perform, well, that would be you've demonstrated some proficiency in an area that I think I'm going to test this out on you. I'm going to give it to group A. I'm going to see how you perform. Or maybe you didn't perform any better and there's a discussion to be had around that. Maybe there's some training that needs to be done, or it's just going to surface more insights. And we can capture information. There's no shortage of, of game engines out there. Um, the ability to kind of provide a visually appealing environment. Uh, you could do that all day long. There's really great, smart, creative people out there that can do this. We're moving more towards a streaming environment. So you can imagine a world where if, if I want to double the number of games that I need to produce every year, but I can't increase my manpower, uh, I shouldn't have to start from scratch uh, every time. I should be able to repurpose ge uh, geospatial models, user interfaces, and sort of start from second or third base. And really my data changes, right? So if I'm gonna change this from a kinetic game to a diplomacy game, to a game on the future of retail uh, in 2030, you know, given uh, a pandemic, uh, I should be able to swap my terrain data rules and detail and just provide it almost like a modular way, a new brain, right? You know, a new data source. And to me, the visualization where, where your data and services meet the user, that is an open, extensible, sort of wide open community that goes from device to things that we've never really considered previously like uh, sound. Uh, what about environments that you, you know, you're not able to communicate verbally, not, you know, nonverbal communications. Um, I think there's a role to be played in that, uh, signals and so on. Uh, you can already see some of this technology being fielded by the military. Um, wearing those lenses seems to be comfortable because it's a lighter piece of equipment now. It can it has better battery life. So it's still early days, but very promising. Auditoriums, you know, for, for lessons and gaming for seminar-based training. I think it's it's a small community now, but you can see how this could grow. And I think the interface, I rarely do you come across a meeting anymore where there's any more mice on the table, right? It's either your finger or your voice now. So uh, we were talking about, you know, we, the technology community, partners and so on, have been talking about the ability to kind of provide the system with nested verbal commands. So it understands the vernacular of DOD, you know, deploy asset ABC to grid one, two, three, four, five, six. It should understand that and execute that command and maybe give the adjudicator a heads up that, hey, this asset's being deployed, seems to be a 40% likelihood of success. You're going to encounter these four problems. And, you know, do you want to go ahead or do you want to override that, flip on the, the AI or, or turn it off and override and just, just go with your intuition. So you should be able to have access to these tools that you use every day in a more of a commercial and serious game environment. With that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let my brother get into what this means coming together in a story form. So, Andrew, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to stop sharing. All right, great. Uh, well, thanks for having me. I, uh, this is definitely something that is, is totally different from what I'm used to uh, speaking uh, about, or at least uh, the environment. So, what I'm just basically going to be talking about today is, is just simple storytelling, you know. Um, I got my start uh, basically at uh, Warner Brothers, and I worked at there for about two and a half years, but I, I ended up leaving, always wanting to go to uh, Pixar, and I was there for about 20 years. I worked on a, a bunch of different films, and then uh, left about three years ago to kind of pursue other things and, and learn. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the reason why I left was because the, the founder of of Pixar, you know, believed in risk and he believed in uh, Ed Catmull, you know, he said, yeah, take a risk, you know, try something different. So I tried something different. I, I and I, I failed miserably at the first job that I, I started off, but I learned a lot. And, you know, today I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, that process. You know, I, I think that Pixar's movies are so good because they literally are doing them over and over. 
and and they make them eight, nine, ten times, you know. And they're saying is story is king. You know, what does that mean, really? That means that at all costs, the story is the most important element in the film, whether it's made with computer graphics or it's made with hand-drawn techniques. Nobody cares at the end of the day. Is the story compelling? Do you care? Do you want to keep watching, right? So if you look at this graphic, at the center of it is, is, a, is a great story, right? On the outer ring of that is the appeal of that story. And then also the believability. Do you buy it? Do you believe the story is real? Yeah? Did somebody say something? Okay. Uh, everybody can hear me, right? Yep. Yeah? Okay, good. And then on the other ring is, is kind of the research collaboration and the iteration of that story. So that's really kind of the, the magic of of a great uh, story is the fact that, sure, you could put anything in the center, right? It could be a, a war game story. But on that other ring, it, it, it still has to have appeal. It has to have characters that you believe in. It has to have um, the correct research that goes into that story that, that makes you say, oh, I, I, I believe that, that's real. Uh, and because otherwise you're just gonna disconnect, right? And then on the bottom is the iteration part, the fact that you're not going to just do the first story, right? If you tell somebody a story of how you got into work today or, or how you, uh, you know, a, a school assignment, you might tell it the first time pretty good, but you tell it again and again, you embellish it. That's where it really starts getting uh, interesting. You know, we're all going to the theater or we're, we're, we're playing games and whatnot. We want to come out with hopefully these kind of themes, these things that make us walk away with something that we remember, not just data, because you, you will forget that. So universal truths like, uh, you know, money doesn't buy happiness, or sometimes the people closest to you will hurt you the most, right? Th those are the things that great stories have, these really kind of universal truths that, that we connect with. But when you're starting a story, I think that you really want to start with something simple. Uh, there was an old uh, uh, contest that uh, Ernest Hemingway was challenged to do. It was called the Six Word Story. And, and his writer friend said, hey, I bet you can't write a, a story in six words that has uh, emotion. And he was like, all right, well, I take that challenge. And he wrote, uh, I think the, the line he said was, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. And, you know, he won, obviously. And so I think that at the very simplest form, you have to figure out what your story is about. You know, what is that premise? What is that kind of light bulb uh, reason why you're making the story? What is the question that you're trying to answer? I think, uh, you know, the, you could say that uh, most stories are, there's basically like two basic stories in, in a lot of ways. There's a, a person goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. You know, if you look at uh, this uh, image of Patton, you know, he, he was probably the character that came into this arena and changed a lot of things, right? Maybe he didn't change as a person as much, he, you know, over the course of the war, that, that's maybe a story point. But a lot of the times you have to figure out what is changing? Is it a character changing? Is it a world changing? And, and that's something that you should think about when you're kind of building a story is that what do you want to change in it? And, and what do you want? How do you want people to see a difference at the end of the story that you're telling? Uh, I always saw these what ifs, you know, these kind of what if moments at the beginning of a story like, oh, well, what if... Um, what if bugs had feelings? What if monsters had feelings? This is obviously the joke slide. Uh, you know, what if uh, feelings had feelings in 2015? But I think that really at, at the essence of it is really what is the theme and, and you're asking yourself that what if, right? The theme is that underlying heart of the premise. You know, if you look at the, the premise of, of Toy Story perhaps, this is a story about jealousy. You know, this is a story about new and uh, coming into this old toys world and changing everything, right? And and this character lose he loses things, you know. So so it's it's a story of, about that. You know, Wally is you know you could say some people would say oh this is a story about environmentalism, but really it isn't. That's just the world that it's it's in. It's really more about a story of a, of, a, of a character that is trying to find love and understand it and. He cares about that more than anything, you know, in the end, you know. Um, Monsters Universe or Monsters Incorporated really is a story that comes from the director's idea. And this is really important to understand is that stories bubble up 
inside you a lot of the times then things will come out you know because of your history and because of how you grew up but this is a you know a story that Pete Doctor made during a time when he had a baby and he didn't really know what to do with it so a lot of this is, is about a, a character that this character comes into this character's life and it changes him and he has to take care of it and and, and putting this character before himself Finding Nemo is all about letting go right letting go of fear and this character is afraid of everything right uh, Incredibles is about what happens when you can't do what you love the most, right? And, and again, that's a great story, uh, you know, theme that you could really, really dig into, right? A lot of people don't understand the, the theme of Up. You know, as a matter of fact, I remember being at a talk at Pixar where a story expert said, he asked the audience, what is, this, what is the theme of this movie? And, uh, and people were trying to come up with the answer. And he said, no, it's about life and death. So I happened to be listening. I happened to be uh, sitting next to the story supervisor, and I said, "Is that is that right?" And he said, "No, that's that's not right. The story is about regret, and so regret is a is a much more specific thing. And you know, a lot of people would call that a story engine. You know, that's something that you could really, really dig into about what the character really feels. You know, life and death is really binary. You know, and I think that specificity is a, is a term that is used in my business and it, and it really equates to having characters that are specific having these themes that are very specific and deep and that's the stuff that you remember you know a lot of the time you could say you need a controlling idea right a controlling idea is basically just not a six word story but it's more of a 25 ish word sentence about your story that really includes the the character it includes the kind of world it includes what is at stake and and what might be lost so if you create a controlling idea you could always go back to that and look at it and say what was my original controlling idea for this story some people also say that you know you need kind of a hook for a story something that really grabs you otherwise you're going to just fall asleep or you're not going to pay attention i think that obviously in war gaming it's very different i don't understand this world i think it's up to everybody in this room to kind of connect the, the dots yourself but a hook is uh you know it's a way to get you into the story you want to build it and then you want to pay off uh you know it's it's very it's very simple like think of a commercial right i'll play this little uh actually i want to play this with sound let me just really quickly share this uh with sound and i think that that you know you'll see that that this is a little bit of a, of a hook here. When we go off to war, when we exercise our rights, when we soar to our greatest heights, when we mourn and pray, when our neighbors are at risk, so I don't know if you could hear that. Uh, could everybody hear that, Steve? Could you hear that? Yep, I, I think right. we could hear that. Yep. So you know, that's like four seconds in. Like that's maybe ten seconds in. Now. And, and that's getting you in. Then they're going to pay it off with buy the Wall Street Journal or whatever it is, right? So you know, I think that it's really important to kind of understand that you have to get your audience hooked quickly. Otherwise, they're just going to they're going to not really understand. And I think that's really uh, about story structure. Story structure is basically like what you hang the story on. It's the skeleton. A lot of people have said that it's it's more of a story spine. There's kind of a an end point and an exit point. You could even look at it like at the the classic writer's kind of graph, uh, which is that there's a beginning and an end, and then there's good fortune and ill fortune, and then the kind of person in a hole uh, idea. Like that person goes in and 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 kind of gets into the kind of belly of the whale, so to speak. And they come out of it again. It's it's really that simple. If you have this simplicity in in even uh, you know your stories that you're doing for, gosh, even a, a keynote presentation, you're you're already going to be ahead of the game. But story structure could be looked at like a, you know the the building blocks of a house. You know if if you don't have a structure, the house falls down, right? You might have a, you know working with an architect that's got these amazing materials and they want to they want to put up like five carbon fiber. But the writer's job is to basically make the house stand up and, and put a structure in place that 
that lets the kind of director understand that, well, if you do it this way, then you're not gonna, you're gonna have this problem later on. And so structure, story structure is super important. It's not the most important, obviously, but it is such a huge element of storytelling. And there are a lot of different story structures, right? There's, there's ones from, you know, 335 BC, and then there are more current ones. The one I'll look at really quickly with you is, is from the book Story by Robert McGee. And it's really simple, right? It's got an inciting incident, progressive complications, crisis, climax, and resolution. And you can really break this down into a, a very simple terminology that you'll, you'll hopefully remember, which is that there's like once upon a time and every day until one day, right? This comes from improv, by the way. I didn't make this up. And because of this, this is now the second act of the, of the story. And because of that, until finally, and since that day, how has the world changed, right? So this could break up into a three act structure, really. You know, you could, you could really break it up. Well, one thing is the moral of the story is, you would usually give that for a child, right? You don't want the moral of the story to come out by saying, and the moral of the story was, you want people to walk away saying, oh, I get it, that, that, that story was about this. But it does break down into three acts, act one, act two, and act three. And one thing about act two is that the because of this and because of that, you never want a story that goes, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then that happened. That's boring. You always want cause and effect so that this one thing happened causing another thing to happen that was far worse. And then something because of that happened changed this. So it's almost like uh, therefore, but, you know, is, is a better terminology to use than and then and then and then. So that's something that you could use in your stories. You know, you could, you could also say that, that it, it breaks down into exposition and inciting incident. Exposition is just telling you about the world. Once upon a time, there was a, a little boy. Uh, he loved a little girl. Uh, they fell in love, right? Uh, every day is their, their kind of thing that they do, that, that you're seeing the life before anything happened. And then until one day is usually the worst possible thing that could ever happen, or sometimes the best, but it's usually the worst. And then the second act of the story, the because of this and because of that, is basically the, the purpose of that in the story is really to change what my brother was talking about a little bit before was a, a belief system, right? In the movie like Up, for instance, the character believes that, you know, he just wants to, to kind of go to this tapui. He doesn't care about anything, but just like kind of floating away and, and taking all his stuff with him. And, by, and you're, you're changing his belief system so that now by the time the movie ends, he cares about a bird and a little boy and a dog, and he doesn't care about any of that stuff. So you can't change belief systems through, through, through words or dialogue. It has to be through action. So you have to show it so through these actions that you're, you're kind of beating the character up and they're changing. And then the, until finally and since that day is basically the third act. It's proving to the audience that they've changed through a giant climax. And then the resolution is the bow tie of like, well, Here's the story now, and this is the world that we live in, right? So you could, you could kind of look at it like in the movie Up, once upon a time there was a little boy who loved a little girl. They got married, they had dreams of having children. They loved each other, they grew old together. His wife got sick and uh, she died and Carl was left alone. What's interesting about this is that this is what is called a prologue. A prologue is really just the function of that is that no matter what, now you're on board with this story. You know, remember cry, everybody cried in this part of the movie. And I think that the point of this story is so that no matter how annoying or bad he is, you still know that he's a good person and we're on board with the story. That's also important in the story is that you gotta get people on board with whatever cause you have and setting it up with some sort of a, a human emotional moment is important. That's what's so important with, especially movies from Disney and Pixar is that, they're built on these kind of emotional bedrocks so that you really do care about the characters. You know, they say that people will forget what you said, what you did, but not how you made them feel. I think there's a, there's a real truth to that. And it may not fit in with, with, you know, war gaming necessarily, but if you kind of sprinkle it around every now and then where you need it, it'll make it a, a lot more compelling. Uh, my brother was talking about this. This was a this was a saying that Andrew Stanton used to say, which he was a director of Nemo and Wally, 
And, it, and it's basically, well, all it means is that you don't want to spoon feed people. You don't want people to kind of like, you don't, you don't want to kind of hit people over the head with ideas and you, you want them to come to it themselves. And because the audience is super smart, they're trying to figure everything out while the story is being told. And you don't want to kind of give away these things that they're supposed to come up with. And I think that, you know, Quentin Tarantino does this really well. He, he, he makes you think a lot in his films. I also think that there's a lot of candor that, you know, in the notes process, uh, you know, that's something that's really, uh, you know, that I think was talked about, Walt was talking about notes. I think that this is just as important as and how you give and take notes is so important to getting any sort of art or story or, or thing better is candor and honesty and trust. You know, this was kind of the secret uh, brain trust, you know, thing that was at Pixar was that the idea that, that a director could come in with his movie, show a bunch of people, they're going to give him honest feedback. And it's really up to him whether they take them, wh whether they take the notes or not. But the idea is that you don't want to be uh, scared to try things new, right? And I think that that's really important. Uh, this is a really great clip. Uh, I, I, I suggest that you watch that little Vimeo link right down there. Michael Arndt was a great writer at Pixar. He explains how great the great stories have three sets of stakes. A good story has got one set of stakes. It's external, like, like diffusing a bomb, like a James Bond movie. A better story has external and internal, meaning the character is going through something internally. There's a human element. And then the best stories have all three, which is a philosophical stake. Think Star Wars, good over evil, right? So definitely watch that. And, uh, and you'll get a lot of uh, information about that, that sort of storytelling. So you have three sets of stakes, and usually like... So you don't have to listen to that, you could just go watch it. Um, hey, juxtaposition, Andrew? you know? Yeah. You're, there seems to be a little bit of interference on the slide. I don't know if it's worth closing and opening up again just to clear the screen, or but maybe some people are seeing a little bit different okay. screen. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's almost over, so... Uh, it's probably from the video, but go ahead. Okay, cool. So, you know, another thing that you could use, like another little technique you could use is the juxtaposition of character, right? How do you use different characters so that, that you're telling your story better, right? In, in Pixar films, it's always kind of these buddy stories about two characters that are kind of handcuffed to each other. They, they have to learn from each other. In some way, they're, they're on a mission together and they, they're forced to kind of deal with each other and learn about each other. And that's something that you could use in your stories. And then uh, I think the last thing I just wanted to talk to you about is just kind of the idea that great stories require a lot of feedback and also a lot of failures and uh, to get them right. You know, they go through many different iterations. They're made over and over. And I think that, that really good stories are not just first drafts. And I think that you'll, you'll the, the saying was suck early, suck often. I think that there's a truth to that, you know. So um, there's also the idea that you have to this was another kind of saying, which was feed the beast, but protect the ugly baby. And what this means is that you have production, you have your game to make, you have whatever you're doing, and you have to get that done. But you don't want to also throw out every idea that doesn't look perfect. You want to let those kind of ugly babies grow so that maybe they, it will turn into a really great idea and a great story. And so that's something to kind of just think about in the back of your head that there's there is a, a split there of feeding the beast and protecting the, the ugly baby. And this is all in Ed Catmull's book, uh, Creativity Inc. Um, and then with notes, you wanna understand the spirit of the note. If somebody said, I don't get this part of the, the story or I don't like this part of the war game, what you have to do is to understand the spirit of the note. What is the kind of note that is being given and how do you digest it and then prescribe something that will fix it? I think that that's really what the spirit of the note is all about, is that you're not just hearing somebody say something, you're really thinking about how do I fix it and what is the right fix for that. And a lot of this is done by forming a story trust. A story trust is just a group of people that you can talk to and that you trust and respect. And they had this at Pixar and they had this at other places I worked at. It's just basically uh, individuals that are really good at what they do and they can give you feedback. So that's pretty much it for me. You could find out all this information on, there's Pixar in a box, which has a lot of this. There's great classes on masterclass.com. There's a Screenwriters University has unbelievable classes. And I have a little website that you can go to that has some clips. So I hope you got something out of it. 
and I hope that it wasn't too uh, off topic. So thank you so much. That's awesome. Thank, thank you, Major. Um, I'm going to share my screen just for a wrap up. Um, Well, if hopefully everybody can hear me. Everybody hear me? Yep, okay. we can hear you. Uh, thank you. So uh, let's we leave you hanging there with a couple of websites. You know, this is kind of where our, our head is at. Sort of thinking about, well, that was a great story process uh, discussion. I think it has a purpose in the initiate phase of gathering the information, defining the problem. Uh, that phase can have a broader aperture and maybe some of the tools and processes can, can be of help. If you think so, we're starting to think about, you know, what, what is kind of the next step in this, in this uh, journey of kind of improving upon the initiation phase, determining the objectives, defining the problem. And these are some of the topics that have come up. So uh, we'll leave you with some contact information. If you're interested in that, that's a class that's, uh, that's in development. I'm not sure the delivery me mechanism, given the state of the world, but you know, we'll figure that out. But the topic should be of interest, uh, because I think it really will help reinforce not only how you get to the technology piece of this equation, but how you can shore it up with uh, gr great storytelling and definition. These are just some of the great partners that help make this deck possible and this talk possible. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their participation, Walt and Andrew, for your time, everybody in this phone call for your election eve time evening morning afternoon wherever you're calling from and i guess with that we are done with the content and uh, kind of kick it over back to the moderator for any next steps thank you yeah well thank you guys i, I appreciate it that uh, that was pretty great for me and and i know i don't know if you were looking but there's a, a pretty um vivacious chat going on so it was um Thank you again for, for presenting, really appreciate it. Um, we do have a, a couple questions uh, and for, um, for anyone else that, if you have questions that come to mind, do feel free to drop them uh, in the chat. Um, so uh, one, this is from maybe about an hour ago or so, but it, it asked if any of the, and this may be for, for Colonel Yates, but it said, do any of the branches use digital twins as part of the decision-making process analysis without involving um, like physical persons as part of the sim as part of the simulations. To the best of my knowledge, not in the context of war gaming. Digital twinning is coming uh, becoming very common in terms of prototyping and model based systems engineering. Know how it's going to perform before you bend metal. But most of that is in at the system level testing and uh, technical application. Not so much in the in the war gaming. Um, because there are so many uh, systems. A place where it might make sense is at, at a uh, ship level um, because there are relatively few ships and, if, and you can simulate the effects of uh, a missile hit on a ship and how that uh, impacts its capability to fight. But when you get into hundreds of helicopters, ground combat vehicles, et cetera, I think that would be unwieldy for a war game, um, but probably uh, is going to become more prevalent in inside training exercises and um, model-based systems engineering evaluations. Hey, well, just one, one uh, additional comment. I know that Slytherin Matrix Games has been working on adding digital twin to the command platform. That might be something that you know, they're, they're looking at. I'm not sure how far down the path they are, but adding that capability of digital twinning a network for for instance um, is something that i know that they have been considering so it's a great question uh, i think there's some early stage work on that with with slytherin and i believe it's um scalable networks if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. got it thank you and i know uh, we, have, we have one more left so again if you have any other that pop in your head toss in the chat um, otherwise, this is tentatively the last question. Um, but this is um, regarding to the, the human terrain simulations. Uh, Carl from the chat had asked if there's any human terrain simulations, but on a macro scale regarding um, culture and ideology. I am not, uh, I'm not personally aware of any that are um, 
being used inside the context of a program of record for uh, decision making or, or training, but there are uh, there are commercial off the shelf applications that have uh, have been used quite frequently um, just to stimulate the decision making process. And it's it's more about in the training realm, it's more about exercising the decision making process and giving you plausibly accurate um, human behaviors to respond to than the right uh, behavior, which um, I'll, I'll use that to highlight one important thing to keep in mind as we bring more digital technology and AI uh, into the war domain of wargaming, it's still simulation. And as the, the first rule of simulation, according to Dr. George Box, is all simulations are wrong, but some are useful. And you've always got to keep that in mind because no matter how much we spend on it and how much we feel compelled to trust the recommendations, of a um, state-of-the-art system, it can still be nothing more than helping us make bad decisions with more data to support our bad decision than ever before. So um, remain skeptical and, and keep the use of this technology um, in its proper place. Don't, don't put your faith in the technology. Uh, FYI, Andrew's got to jump unless there's some questions for him. We can put him at the front of the line if anybody's got any questions for Andrew. Um, so a question just popped up, and it it might kind of a touches on how intersectional this whole thing is. But it it, it asks, how would you? Uh, this is from uh, Eva, who said, how would you reconcile the tension between storytelling, like Andrew had had laid out, and ensuring player agency? Um, and she asked in a war game, but I think this is I think this is also relevant to Andrew. Um, kind of as you're creating like a story, how, you know, guiding the story versus having some kind of character development. Um, so kind of a, a, any three of you feel free to uh, feel free to touch on that. That's a good question. I mean, I, I, Steve, you, you might be able to touch on that a little bit, but just character development, you know, is, it's just an evolving process. I think that you just want to go in knowing uh, start, you know, starting with tropes, but then getting a little bit more specific about, you know, who the, who the, who the characters are in your story. And then I think Walt, you know, uh, was talking a little bit about uh, a story where I think, I, I don't remember, it was, it was early, but we were talking a little bit about how you know, somebody needed $20 to kind of, um, you know, they, they were, they were going to be paid $20 because they needed to have food. And they were willing to use that twenty dollars, or they would they would set a bomb on the side of the road, you know. And I think that the, those types of specificity of character, you know, I feel like that that's the stuff that, in a story, it makes it really a lot more real, you know. But I, I'm not sure about the, the implementation. Maybe uh, Steve or Walt can talk about. That. No, I think what Walt was trying to get across there was um, the character is vulnerable. And had I known that this region was suffering from, uh, you know, lack of food or or whatever cause someone to make a decision to plant an ID uh, in exchange for $20 for food, um, you know, makes the character vulnerable and it's probably another data point for consideration during the war game. Just maybe an environmental. Great, thank you. Um, and I know uh, Sebastian had, had just asked a question um, about what technologies to see with the most potential for digital war gaming. Uh, I'll take that one and then you know, we can go around the horn. Maybe Andrew's got some digital tools that they, they make that magic for movie making with. Um, clearly the cloud, but not so obvious in discussion is frankly CRM. Um, a lot can be done with decision analysis and uh, prioritization and predictive capabilities. I mean, remember the advertising industry after the innovation that took place on Wall Street, you know, that, that was the first group to Put a flat screen monitor on their desk. They were first to carry mobile devices at any kind of scale and that kind of tailed off and then the advertising industry kind of went at it with incredible innovation around looking at data. We're all seeing it in our inboxes now how how precise their targeting campaigns can be. I mean there's a lot of technology behind that and I think you can kind of distill it down to customer relationship platforms and decision and predictive analytics that kind of all grew up in that CRM world. And you know, I can get it on my phone. It, it can ingest massive amounts of data. And I think the cloud and the transport just enables that. So uh, that, that's my point of view. And maybe Andrew and Walt have a comment as well. 
I, I don't have a name for it, but I'll describe what I think is, offers the biggest potential is technology that links effects between different domains. So this, for instance, the social media or the um, informational domain where a military operation could be stopped because diplomatic um, influence removes permission for a strike group to, to pass through territorial waters or to um, for basing and so forth. And that can be done very softly and subtly um, through social media campaigns. And many of these uh, don't assume we're, we're talking about big tech in the United States. Our social media isn't necessarily relevant in the, in the areas where um, we have national interests. Um, it may be social media networks where we don't have um, nearly enough language experts and uh, people to to parse and to to understand that. But you know, we we focus so much on the kinetic and the logistical, but I think we also have the um, the human terrain, the EMF spectrum for radars and sensors, and the um, the network uh, layer for for IP uh, networks. And how do those how do actions in one domain get translated into effects in another? And I think just kind of following up on um, the new technology, Sebastian had a, a follow-up saying, what do you think is the biggest obstacle um, in the shift to digital gaming um, and, and incorporating more technology? And then, you know, maybe what, how, how could you overcome whatever obstacles exist? Um, just having had those discussions across, you know, different geographies globally, it seems to come down to networks and security and culture. There's no question, nobody is going to give any kind of issue with the value and economic value of cloud and, and, and the promise that it holds. I think it comes down to uh, you know, bandwidth, latency. Uh, concerns over classified content where maybe open source uh, information sources would just do fine. So the way you can overcome that, uh, start, start simple, use notional data. Don't try to build the entire thing, take a, take a slice of it. Like the HoloLens example was interesting, just maps. Get maybe off of a table into a three-dimensional plane and see how that works and continue to iterate and add to it. And these are, these are modular components mostly open architecture these days. So I think that's one way that, um, that you know, the Marines have thought about this, the Navy and so even NATO countries have gone about this in every domain. Walt, anything you've, I missed there? Uh, not, nothing that I would add. Okay, well, so I think the, the questions have slowed to a, a trickle. So I was gonna let Andrew off, but you, I think we might be able to end it. Um, Oh, just actually one last question. And while I ask it, uh, Andrew, would you, or sorry, Stephen, would you mind putting on um, the last slide with your contact information? Just in yeah, case sure. No, uh, no, no problem at all. Great, great. So um, we had, uh, someone asked whether uh, Epic or Microsoft had developed a war gaming capability that was able to incorporate storytelling. Well, um, I, I will offer as a, a representative from Epic that Epic's uh, desires to be a platform on which simulation applications for government customers are developed, but unlike their entertainment gaming, gaming uh, Epic itself is not developing the content for that. On the other hand, uh, many developers using Epic as a platform for government customers are addressing um, aspects of uh, the processes that support wargaming. So using one of the hardest things to get just 10 years ago, um, if you think about it, the rise of the unmanned aerial system, uh, a remotely piloted aircraft with high fidelity visual sensors, now that that's present on the battlefield, you have to have it in the command post to make the decisions in the same way. So it was very, High, highest priority desire to have a good high visual um, image generator and simulation environment, and we couldn't get it. We couldn't get anything that approached what you would see from a predator, a, a global hawk, or a scan eagle um, 
in the simulation environment. And that was a source of continual frustration for the users because they say, I, this is the platform that I use and yet we can't train with it in simulation. You want me to come do command post exercises, but you deprive me of the types of sensors that I have. And so that's, that's an area where now in 2020, there are a tremendous number of photorealistic uh, sensor platforms that can be correlated to your um, terrain and your war game scenario. So you can see what is actually there and what it's doing if you have those type of sensors in your scenario. Great, great. So, so I think finally the, the questions have, have ended. I want to give a huge thank you to Andrew Gordon, Stephen Gordon, and Colonel Yates um, for a really great presentation. And a special thank you for Andrew for reminding me that I did cry in the first five minutes of Up. Uh, that hit pretty hard. Um, but so as you can see, so everyone's contact information is on this slide. Uh, we had a pretty good, we have, I think it was close to about 130 participants. Um, so big thank you to all of our participants for coming, uh, especially as we were in this kind of bizarro Christmas Eve. Um, and uh, yeah, unless any of our uh, panelists or, you know, um, presenters have any kind of, uh, you know, last words, uh, I think we're, we're probably okay uh, to, to end it. And I want to thank everyone for coming. All right, thank thank you. you as well, Grant, for moderating. Sebastian, for letting us take, take time tonight. I appreciate your moderation skills. Thank you as well.